All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Phil Estes. This is Sean Murakami. We're both from IBM Cloud Open Technologies. Um, we're going to talk to you today and hopefully present something that is more to get you thinking about these topics. Um, these capabilities that we're going to try and demonstrate are not integrated into OpenStack yet in any way. In fact, they're just now appearing in the underlying engine that we're going to show you. Uh, but I think it's an interesting topic, hopefully one that, uh, that uh, you can take something away and, um, and we'd love to hear feedback on what we put together. So, um, and I hit the wrong button because it's not my presenter. Um, so, a little bit of background. Um, if you've been around the OpenStack community, you know if you've looked at the, the Nova support document, uh, live migration in a hypervisor scenario uh, is sort of accepted and, and in many of the hypervisors that are supported, this is a capability that you have today. You can look there on the, uh, the OpenStack documentation site. Um, but also, obviously, VMs are just sort of one uh, class of virtualization now that, um, if you're here in the last talk, containers c and, and their use across the ecosystem continue to grow. Uh, projects like Magnum, Murano, Kala, Courier, Kubernetes. Um, there's, there's obviously an expectation that as container use grows, that there also uh, could be interest in the same capability to live migrate my container, not my VM, but my container uh, between compute hosts. And so that's kind of the, the background um, for what we'd like to, to talk to you about. Um, so what, why, why don't we have this today? And why is it already existing in, in the hypervisors that you saw on the last slide? Uh, well, one of those obvious reasons is that a hypervisor is really uh, controlling a, a completely emulated uh, machine. If you know anything about um, BIOS and, and, and bare metal hardware, suspend resume is a, is a solved problem, and therefore hypervisor-based lab migration, uh, again, I'm glossing over some of those details, but it's a solved problem. It's a, it's a known entity of how to do that, and so hypervisors that support lab migration can take advantage of this solved problem. Containers, as many of you know, are simply uh, a process on your Linux system. There's a lot of, of interesting things going on there related to isolation. Uh, but at, at its source, um, they're just processes. And so, you know, we have to ask, can the Linux kernel migrate a process? And, you know, the answer is, well, not very easily until um, in recent years the CRIU project um, checkpoint restoring user space is what that stands for. Uh, this work began around 2011 or 2012 in the kernel. Uh, by the time you got to the 3.11 kernel uh, and the CRIU um, code base in late 2013, you could actually use CRIU uh, to checkpoint and restore a process on your Linux system. And then uh, earlier this year, CRIU 2.0 was released. Um, so this brought about, again, the capability to start to have this ability to migrate a process. Again, CRIU wasn't necessarily about migration, but more about checkpointing, so freezing and getting all the state. Let's talk about that just a little bit to give you a better picture. Uh, so CRIU was proposed, a project loved, uh, led by Pavel, uh, many of you know him from the OpenVZ team. Um, key difference, again, I, I've, I sort of jumped in with that history and started with CRIU. That wasn't the first uh, opportunity that uh, people in the Linux kernel community attempted a checkpoint restore capability. Uh, but the key difference here was that Pavel's uh, uh, proposed implementation would do much of that work in user space. And so much uh, of the kernel work was done early on and as you see here, completed by the 3.11 release. And so what CRIU does, based on these capabilities in the kernel, it handles freezing all this process state. And so taking things like the process, thread info, capabilities, the UID, GID, uh, all the memory, the open files, 
Unix sockets, network sockets, and uh, there's some very interesting magic that they got into the Linux kernel about a new state, a new TCP state that allows this migration of even uh, a live socket. Uh, IPC, timer signals, all these things are co collected by CRIU when you ask it to checkpoint a process, and this becomes a set of metadata that I can now take somewhere else and restore this process. Uh, that's a very quick and brief overview. Again, I'm glossing over many of the complex details. The CRIU.org uh, wiki has a lot more detail on how that works and some of the history behind that. So, um, we've talked about CRIU. Again, this is uh, some Linux kernel capabilities, a, a binary, you can build CRIU from source, run it on your Linux system. What, what needed to happen next for a container engine like Docker was to marry these two worlds of Docker's running a process. Can I now have CRIU do the same checkpoint and restore capability inside the Docker engine? And so uh, Ross Boucher uh, has been working on this uh, for a very long time. Um, initially, as some of you may know, uh, the Docker engine now relies both on libcontainer, which it has for a couple years, but libcontainer became part of the OCI, and run C is the sort of wrapper around libcontainer. So CRIU support came to run C. Um, I should have put that in the charts. Um, I think by summer of 2015 it was already there. Uh, if you went to DockerCon in San Francisco that year, you would have seen a popular demo of Quake, uh, the game backend being migrated using this support. But to actually bring that to the Docker engine required sort of a design of what, are gonna, what will the capabilities be, what part of the CRIU interface will we expose, and, and what will that look like. So we, that work was finally finished and we merged that into the Docker engine just last month. And so that's not even in a Docker release yet. What we're running today in our demos is a binary built from master with this PR merged. But when the Docker 113 release comes out in about a month, you'll be able to use the uh, checkpoint capabilities. So a very quick overview, again, the, the full documentation on Docker Checkpoint and Docker Start from a Checkpoint uh, will be in the Docker 113 release. You can look at that PR that was on the last slide and get a lot more detail. But the simplest view is that uh, when I've got a running container, I can say Docker Checkpoint, uh, the name of my container or its ID, and the name of a checkpoint, and that will basically pause the container run CRIU to generate this set of metadata, and now I'm able to Docker start from a named checkpoint and restart that container. Uh, for Docker 113, this will be part of what's known as the experimental build um, to allow some time to sort of shake out use cases and make sure that the way this is exposed to users is valuable. Um, and really, this model really associates that checkpoint with a very specific container, and we'll get into why that makes sense, because once I try and do it on another system or with a different container, I have to consider all these metadata concerns about how to get the exact configuration into another image or another container. So, in essence, live migration is not an intended feature of this initial release. Uh, in fact, the CRIU, uh, Wiki, again, has a lot more information on, on some of the challenges and, and how to do live migration with CRIU. And so some of what we put together for today is the, those same challenges and concepts brought to Docker and how we've overcome them and how they may be uh, solved in the future. So that gives you a good background on where CRIU came from, uh, what its capabilities are, uh, how it came to be in Docker, and now I'm going to turn it over to Sean, and he's going to talk through kind of, uh, again, these challenges in uh, working with my, using the CRIU support in Docker to actually support migration to another host. Thanks, Phil. So I'll be talking to you about some of the challenges and things that we've done um, 
as part of demos going forward. And this is all going to be running on some OpenStack VMs. So when we look at container migration, there's really kind of two paths that um, a process or container takes. One is an in-memory path. So if you have a process or uh, an application that does everything in memory um, with any, without any file system changes, that's one path. We'll go through those uh, details. And the second is if the application or service running inside the container makes any changes um, within the file system to keep track of any state or <clears throat> other metadata information that it requires to run. So the first in-memory only sequence, um, these are sort of the steps that we've done to demonstrate the migration of how a container moves from one host to the other. So the first thing, as Phil mentioned, there's a, a checkpoint um, that has been integrated into the experimental release of Docker, um, and that kind of freezes that, that container. Uh, the second thing is that we need to then take that checkpoint uh, metadata, uh, which is stored as part of the container information. Uh, on the remote host, we can then pull or prefetch the Docker image, the base image that was used for the initial host container onto the target, and that kind of speeds up that migration because all we're doing then is migrating that metadata, uh, the checkpoint metadata information over to the new host um, and dropping it into the, the, the new container that we're starting up on that remote host. And uh, we specify which particular checkpoint uh, we're restoring on that remote host. So the second, second path is, again, is the uh, file system changes. So for example, if an application that's running some maybe state or index information to a file system, uh, this process is a little more complicated. Um, because that information is now within the container's file system, it's no longer just in memory. So now we've got to migrate both the in-memory context as well as the file system changes. And that requires us to take um, the running container and migrate that entire thing over to the remote host. So we have the first two steps are effectively the same. We checkpoint the container. Uh, <clears throat> when the container is checkpointed, we take that metadata, tar it up, and then we also need to make sure we inspect the, the container. So the inspect, the inspect on the uh, container's metadata tells us things like what's running, um, what commands were executed, environment variables, things like that. And um, as we'll mention later in the, the challenges, a lot of this information typically you would get um, as part of either uh, the, the base image metadata. <clears throat> the metadata, when you, when you export from a running container, does not get carried over to the other host. So we need to make sure we recreate that when we start to create the container on the new host. So once we create a container on the new host from the exported container, uh, we then have to, we go through the same steps of taking the checkpoint metadata, dropping it into the right file system, and then starting it up. So other challenges, again, handling, as I was mentioning, the handling metadata, uh, there, there are certain things that, um, we, that are deficient right now with the current implementation that we don't get all that running state information within the, of the running container when we migrate it over. So we have to make sure that we um, do this as a sort of another step as part of that migration path. Uh, the second kind of key point is sort of network information. So a lot of, I, I guess the underlying premise for when you checkpoint and restore a container, all the network information persists in that checkpoint metadata. So it assumes that it's going to come back up with that same IP and MAC address. So when you're migrating the container over to the next host, if you already have a container running with an IP that is expecting to start back up, it runs into issues and can't, you can't restore that container at that point because uh, the Docker engine complains that this IP cannot be allocated to that container. And then finally, uh, volume support. Um, uh, this is more of a traditional challenge of migrating persistent data from one host to the other. Um, there could be other data sources running to it. Um, so uh, 
these, I think these are some of the things that is being kind of looked at within the Docker community as well um, as part of uh, some of these use cases. And then I, I think in, uh, in the OpenSAC community, I think even the talk in this room, uh, the next talk considers that world, not, not the runtime migration, but the whole idea of persistent data migration uh, in, in the OpenStack world. So that may be interesting for those that, that are interested in that piece as well. Okay. So we want to kind of spend the rest of the time uh, demonstrating a few different use cases of how you would utilize this checkpoint restore feature. So the first one we're going to do is show just a very simple uh, checkpoint restore on a single host just to give you an idea of the command sequence that we run through for, for checkpointing and starting that back up. The second one is more applicable to like real world scenarios if you have like an in-memory database um, and we want to migrate that because maybe the host that it's running on it has to do maintenance or if it just crashes. The third, if we have time, uh, is a video streaming. So for example, if you have a video streaming service, um, we have transcoder containers streaming out. We're going to try and connect to it and then migrate it and resume from that checkpointed state. So I'll go over some overviews, and then we'll jump directly into some shell. So the first one, again, what you're going to see um, on one host, we're going to run a busy box container with a counter, and all it's going to do is start counting. Once we checkpoint, it'll freeze, and we'll then restore it, and it should resume, because all of this is really happening within the container memory state. Do you want to make that larger? Is that, that good? good? Larger? More. Larger, larger. Okay. That should be. More. More. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is that good? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Okay, so what you see here is we did a Docker run with uh, called Simple using a busy box image, and we're just iterating over our loop and counting every second. So here we can see with the Docker logs, we're just outputting the numeric sequence. And so when I hit the space bar, um, that invoked the Docker checkpoint command. So we see here Docker checkpoint create, we're creating a um, checkpoint of the running container name simple called first. And so we can see here that this simple container has exited, so it's no longer running. And what we're doing now is restoring. So we start using the checkpoint flag for, with the first uh, checkpoint name and restarting that container called simple, and the counter just keeps going. It's probably worth noting that the counter didn't restart at zero, obviously. The, right. the logs dash f, dash f replayed that part, uh, if you noticed. If we don't do that, it, will event, it would start from zero if we, if we didn't actually restore right, from right. that. Right, Obviously, the whole point state. of checkpointing is that the in-memory state of that process was preserved at that moment, and uh, we didn't have to obviously start a new process. And that's obviously the magic of CRIU is restoring that process to its exact state using the metadata. All right, time for a more interesting example. So this is going to be um, an in-memory database migration example. Uh, so f we created a front end, uh, which is going to show us uh, information that's coming in from a tweet feed. So we're going to start up. Uh, I think we're going to start up two containers, uh, both searching Twitter from a Twitter stream, looking for a particular string. That's going to feed into um, our Redis service that we're going to start as a container running on host B. Um, and then what we're going to do is checkpoint that container while we're getting the feeds, migrate over to the second host C, and resume it. And what we should see is that within the viewer, the count and the uptime stays uh, consistent and continues on without resetting. So again, this is all happening inside of Redis running in an in-memory uh, <clears throat> mode. All right, 
this is going to be complicated. Phil, you want to go through it while I set this up? Yeah, so I'll talk so Sean can type. Um, so as you mentioned, there will be a couple containers involved. So we have um, a Go, a simple Go application that's using Twitter streaming API, searching for strings that, that we can set up. Um, that's simply writing to a Redis queue. Um, and the Tweet Viewer is, is a simple Node.js app, connects to Redis and says, hey, what are your hashtags? What are you searching on? And just starts displaying. It has two different views, an admin view and a viewer. So uh, as that picture showed, we need a load balancer because as we're going to migrate this container, we don't want um, the front end to have to reconnect to a different, different host. So the load balancer uh, provides that uh, place to, to register the new uh, instance on host C. So what I'm showing here is uh, we have a container called LB. Uh, it's an Nginx container. Um, and here what we'll see, uh, and what happens is that um, these services, as they get executed and started, they will register into the uh, load balancer. And it, we do some kind of service discovery here. And what you'll see is that this services conf should start showing the new upstream path to those containers. So that's what I have running there. So we're going to do a run Redis and register. All right, so we got a container running. All right, so our, our Redis store is now running. Uh, I can see it's running on port 3288 mapped to the internal Redis port. Um, and on this side, it registered itself. So we registered host A or B uh, with the same port. Um, <clears throat> and so basically now when we connect through this load balancer, it will feed all the information over to uh, that particular Redis server. So now we're going to do a run tweet, tweet demo. So what run tweet demo did is start up two tweet to Redis containers. And these tweet to Redis containers are basically searching the Twitter stream for uh, particular strings. And what we're look, going to be looking for is op the, the keyword OpenStack and Docker. And then the third container is the tweet view container. And that's going to be our admin view that will show you what's currently running. So I'll switch over to that. Um, and the viewer is running on port. All right, so the admin view is showing that the tweet to Redis uh, containers have started collecting tweets. There's six OpenStack tweets and three Docker tweets. The uptime here is highlighted in purple. So our Redis container has been up for uh, almost a couple minutes, and tweets should continue to appear. So if you want to help the demo out, you can keep tweeting about OpenStack and Docker, and this count should go up faster. Uh, but so now what we're going to do is just migrate uh, the Redis container over to another host. And what you'll see is that this upstream server should change to the new host so that the, the viewer going through the load balancer should then automatically redirect all the traffic to the new container running on. Well, the same container actually running on the new yeah, host. Yeah, exactly. So, so like those steps that, that Sean showed toward the end of the slides, he scripted this up so that all those steps about exporting the file system um, exporting the, met the metadata, getting that onto the new host, creating the container with the same data. Um, so this is the new host. There's no Docker containers running. And we'll just do a migration. So I'm going to migrate to host 10.3.3.3. So, so this is where, yeah, Docker checkpoint command is running. Um, now it's SSHing to the target, setting up the container. If we go look at the, uh, yeah, if we look at this host, there's no longer a Redis container running here. If we look at the new host, the Redis container is now running there. So this is 10.3.3.3 on port 32774. 
and that got updated automatically. So the, yeah, the load balancer has been updated. So if things work like they should, I'll just refresh this thing. Yeah, you can refresh that, or you can leave it running. Either way, it's going to it's going to reconnect through the load balancer. And you notice our uptime didn't go back to zero. It's still climbing, and the number of tweets is still climbing. And if we looked at our, at our viewer, um, it'll start reading from that Redis uh, feed and 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 displaying them. Um, and if we go switch back and forth between the admin, you can see the counts either going down or up as it, as it displays them uh, in the viewer. Uh, it subtracts from the queue and, so and obviously. Effectively using Redis as like a, a queue for Yeah, Redis is a queue defeats. between these two applications. Um, so do you want to migrate it back to yeah, let's do the that. first host? So the the you know some of the interesting challenges here we've already talked through some of them, uh, but one of the interesting things we found is that uh, even though we fronted this with a load balancer, um, we found that the Node.js Redis client implementation uh, seems to get really frustrated with socket connection refused and trying to reconnect. So we had to add. Um, more code than we would have liked to have had to add to, to try and handle the fact that the Redis server goes away even, even if it's for a second or two. The interesting thing is that the Go library, which the tweet to Redis containers are using, we had to do nothing. So again, migration of socket-based services really depends, again, on, on the library you're using and its capability to handle um, some, of those, some of those conditions. So the container was migrated load balancer updated back to 3.3.2, and in the UI. Oh, and there's Sean. Nice. Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, admin count, still going. Right, so our uptime is still climbing, the tweets are, are still changing, and we've migrated uh, away from host B to C and back to B. Um, all right, so all right. we are uh, six minutes from closing time. So do you want to try the video sure. streaming? All right, we've got to reset the. So uh, the final, final demo, um, again, um, uh, deals in this area of sort of trying to handle migration of, of a uh, TCP-based service using a load balancer front end. And uh, I think what Sean found after uh, quite a few days of pain is that it's actually very difficult to keep that stream alive for a client, again, in our case, using VLC. Uh, maybe there are other clients that handle that in, in a different way. Um, but we, we found it to be a bit challenging. So what I did here was um, I started up a, um, a container. Sorry, I should show this. A container. Uh, Streaming this buck, bu free, you know, free buck bunny video, uh, running on this host, and um, I'm routing it through the the load balancer. So you can see here. So now we have a HTTP stream pool uh, running on this particular host. So I'm going to connect through that load balancer as well. So here we have the the video running. So the reason why it's kind of blipping and stuff, what we're running this in a, a, a small VM that I created on OpenStack, and I forgot to uh, bump up the resources. So it's actually doing the transcoding within that small VM, and so that's why it's kind of slow right now. But what I'll do is uh, simulate a uh, migration. So we ran into some issues, particularly with some networking issues with the, uh, the checkpoint restore in Docker. And so um, what we'll do is checkpoint it on this same host, though. Yeah, so in essence, trying to, to keep that stream alive, um, at least for where we are at the moment, uh, this one's just doing a checkpoint and restore back to um, the same host. And e even with that, I think you still have to basically ask the VLC client yeah. to continue. So uh, it, the, the container was checkpointed and restored, load balancer was updated, um, right now, it's probably buffered, but what's going to happen is since the socket information was um, 
changed because of the port change and so forth, um, the client should have to, we would manually have to reconnect at this point, so. Should we go back to charts? All right, so uh, given there's only a few minutes left and maybe someone has a burning question, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, bring up, uh, you wanna go back to the slides? Yeah, or do you come back to slides. Sorry though, <laughs> I forgot to go through that. Yeah, anyway, so the, This is what kind of happened for the video stream. Right. Um, so obviously integration with OpenStack, there's a couple options here. Um, all these migration steps that we're kind of handling manually in scripts. Um, if this were a capability that a project like Magnum wanted to offer, then, then uh, these capabilities would have to be integrated at some level in a project like that to basically handle all the things that we talked about, this container metadata migration, the file system migration. Uh, hopefully some of the networking challenges uh, could be mitigated with overlay support for the for this kind of thing and, and the last bullet there kind of reflects that uh, with a orchestrator that uh, can handle service discovery that would reduce our requirement to have to run our own load balancer and, and do the registration uh, as containers come and go ourselves so there's a couple of our, our ideas any quick questions before we close out uh, can you use the mic please there's a mic right there. Can you please show the version of Docker? Which version are you using? Oh, uh, this so is 113 experiment. Well, yeah, yeah, so it's it's 113 pre-release because 113 is just about to go to code freeze. So this the pull request that adds the checkpoint restore capabilities um, is is about to be available in 113. Any other questions? If uh, after you know migration, right? If uh, uh, the other uh, node we have the same port or same process running, right? Does they con they conflict because you're sending the metadata? So yeah, it's a, I'm not sure I fully understand the the question. Uh, actually, like in one node, uh, uh, my my particular Docker is a process, right? They have some process ID, and maybe some of applications running some kind of port, right? If we migrate. In the other node, we have some kind of same port or process running. So it will change the process ID or the port or dynamically or what? Yes, so, conflict. so when we're in the Docker world, you can get auto, so that what was happening is you're getting auto assignment of a free port uh, on the target. And that's our load, and then we were registering that with the load balancer to the port we, we want fronted for the application. But yes, you could get conflicts without that kind of setup. And that's what we talked about. If the IP is already allocated, is already allocated, then and th those are things that can be corrected with other capabilities that exist. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, did you measure the downtime of the uh, migration, uh, especially for the container with big memory? The downtime. Yeah. So, um, so obviously cre that. During that time, Creu is handling the collection of that metadata. So as memory is larger, that can affect the performance. What we found is the bigger issue is gonna be if you actually have to migrate file system content. So maybe a complete solution would be something with a clustered file system. So you're not actually copying like a, um, obviously you wouldn't wanna copy movies in, in this movie player as part of that, uh, migration because that copy time could be significant. The checkpoint metadata is relatively small compared to the image size, so. All right, a uh, question behind you there. Yeah, so, so to sort of follow on to that, I mean, have you uh, looked at what a migration model would be for what the migration time would be? Depending on what your application looked like, you know, how much of the file system you used, you know, how would you be able to predict how long the migration time would be in order to do something like to have a migration policy. You know, which containers do you move? Yeah, so we, we, we haven't spent time on that. Uh, obviously, as I said at the beginning, this is kind of early work and I think a lot of that uh, yeah, would be I, kind of the next step. I, I know, I've been waiting for the preview work to, to uh, my, uh, mature. <laughs> okay, so, yep. uh, so you know, these are the questions I'm sort of uh, looking at myself. Yeah, right. All right, okay. to honor the next 
talk. I think we need to end here. We'll be around over here on the side if you have more questions, but thanks for coming. Thank you.